chwen yan li ro. Tana ke ke kwa angwe sile. Ujira. Yon se ro akwa ne. Stan kwe ya chu kwa rufa. Wa suran ki e. En ye che wo chare. Dijne ganya dare. Wa kamo dijne. San Domingo e kwe we awe. Ya kore o dase. E kwe we. Ya kore o dase e ne ufne. Ya kore o dase e wi se dijne u herukwe. We ne che wa de get wrong. Ya kore o dase awe. Ya kore o dase u herukwe. Gane. Ya kore o dase e gazio. Gane. Ya kore o dase e. Jine gane. We ne che wa de get wrong. Ya kore o dase e. Kan he gerwa ujire usahere dijne kashe wa yakuri odase hedakte garakwe yakuri odase hine kahaka yakuri odase hide hune chewa de gerwa yakuri odase kasura she nyawa hune chewa de gerwa yakuri odase yune shararwe hune chewa de gerwa yakuri odase garaya wage. In it, jet wide to get right. Okay, here's a little bit about me. I represent the Cape Fear Band of Skurude and Wokan Indians. I'm a Cape Fear Wokan Indian and I'm Skurude. It's because that's what my family is. I descend from Wokan Indians, contemporarily, contemporarily known as Cape Fear Indians, and I descend from the chiefs of the Skurude who migrated to Bladen County, specifically uh, to the portion of Bladen County that's still called Bladen County today. And you had others who migrated to a portion of Bladen County that became Robeson County, the Drowning Creek area. So Bladen County, the whole county uh, became home to migrating Skurude people on both ends of the county. Our people have been here from Seabreeze, Yichirari, to Lake Wakama before written record because we said we were here. We don't need John Lawson's blessing, permission, or records to state that. My people in the Cape Fear are kin to Machapunga, Matamesquite, Maharan Okanichi, Saponi Kohari, Lumbee, and Wakama Suwan of North Carolina, and Wakama Indian people of South Carolina. We have a lot of shared ancestry. You know, people throughout our tribe, we have a lot of shared ancestry. Me personally, I have a lot of shared ancestry. I've actually connected with some of the family in these various tribes. I have to give credit and honor to all of the tribes that I just mentioned for their continued resilience and the will to not only survive, but thrive in the face of opposition, occupation, reclassification, and continuity of culture in its various forms. Many of them back in the 50s and 60s and 70s were being called other than what they were, but they persisted anyway. And today, they're thriving. And if you go to, to powwow cultures, you will see these tribes and you will see what they have to offer and how they present themselves. The culture continues. So I give honor and much respect to all of them. Last but not least, I have to give honor to my Tuscarora people still here in North Carolina. The various Tuscarora communities still keeping the culture strong and inspiring in us who haven't been on the road as long as some of them. And I have to give a special nyawe. Thanks and appreciation to the Skarure Gatnoaka Nation for all of the hard work they're doing, even in the face of opposition, to even just think about speaking or re reuniting the Tuscarora Confederacy, keeping our food seeds from extinction and the various things they're doing for our culture. I'm in close contact with some of my relatives and like I said, in some of these tribes, while others play the colonizers game of denial while riding their invisible white horses. But you know, they're the minority because with my experience, most of the people are for unity. 
So I'm not really concerned about the few who don't want to unite or the few who practice colorism or the few who don't have any vision and can't see past their own nose. The majority of the people in these tribes want unity. So instead of going into a full biography, uh, genealogy of myself, I'm going to try to keep this short because it's really not about me. Plus, I'm not a dog and, uh, and I'm not a horse. So I don't have to prove my pedigree to anyone outside of my people. My word is my bond. My word is my word and my word is my bond. It is what it is, regardless of your emotions or how you feel or what you think you might know. My bloodline is deeply rooted here. And it's my family's blood that ran thick here in the land and the water. The average adult, since we're talking about blood, has about 1.2 uh, to 1.5 gallons of blood. Or we can say 4.5 to 5.5 liters of blood circulating inside their bodies. Oh, by the way, that's my that's my degree of Indian blood, just in case you were wondering. Should a person's identity be reduced to a number in the form of percentages? My blood doesn't convert into percentages. I'm sorry. I'm a whole number, not a percentage. I know the colonial language is used to reducing people to percentages and fractions. For example, three fourths of a person. And one drop rules and all that kind of stuff. I'm a whole person completely, you know, indigenous because my ancestral bloodlines say so and because I identify as such I'm not saying other races didn't marry into our families because on the east coast that's almost impossible to avoid I embrace all of my admixtures and the freedom it gives me in expressing my lineage just like the Cherokee Nation chief of Oklahoma openly expressed how proud he is of his Irish ancestry. He said this openly, how proud he was of his Irish ancestry. Guess what? Like him, I'm also proud of my Irish ancestry because I have it. I'm also proud of my uh, Middle Eastern, South Asian, and Northeast African ancestry. I love it. I embrace it because it created me. I don't hide from my admixtures. I embrace it. Having admixtures of other indigenous nations, for example, indigenous American and an indigenous African, just means you walk in two nations. We honor two spirit people as we should, if you know the history and the culture of two spirit. But in the same breath, you dishonor two nations people because of some kind of BIA policy. You honor to spirit, dishonor two nations. Our ancestors didn't do that. So why are you doing that today? You started doing it to become accepted by the ones who enslaved, murdered, and genocided us to be accepted by them. If you can't see anything wrong with this practice, then you're part of the problem. And according to the prophecies from the Hopi, Cherokee, Skoruri, and beyond, if you have that type of thinking, you're not going to make it. I'll leave it at that. I hope more of our West of the Mississippi, Western Plains relatives will become more compassionate about the Eastern Willard indigenous plight for survival since we were ground zero for colonial invasion because during the, ro the, uh, the rule of the Lord's proprietors the Carolinas was actually a part of Barbados a lot of people don't know that I don't profess to be an expert in other people's history like and I'm going to just use the Lakota for example the Lakota have a proud history they have great accomplishments. They have a history dealing with the United States during wartime, capturing the flag. 
They have chiefs who they're very proud of. They have a proud history. I don't want to. I don't want to take away. By me being east of the Mississippi, trying to be an expert in someone so far away from me to uh, the lands, to their territory where I have not spent any time to get to know the intricacies and, and, and all the subtleties of the families out there. I'm bringing this up because a lot of people like to butt into other people's business. And try to be experts in other people's business and other people's affairs. You're not going to hear me talk about them in that manner. I ask the same thing from people out there and elsewhere. If you don't know our families, you, please don't start saying, oh, you're not a native. You're not a this and you're not a that. You don't know. You, you don't, you know. You're not an expert in our families. You don't know our villages beyond what's written in the records. In the Cape Fear and the Choya, that's the only record that was down uh, recorded down in Southport. Do you even know where Southport is? Do you know Nechoya? Do you know what that is? That's the only one. They said that was the only village that they that's named. All the other villages are unknown. Well, we know what they are. If you don't know the family names, some of those names today have changed and wasn't the names of the 1700s. Families intermarried, intermixed in isolated communities. If you don't know the subtleties of our communities and you're not even from here, don't try to be an expert in our history. Show some compassion of the rape and the murder and the genocide that our grandmothers and our grandfathers, our uncles, our aunts, our children went through over here. We dealt with the first, we dealt with the occupation and the settlement. We dealt with the Eastern invasion, the doctrine of discovery. They persuaded, coerced, other indigenous people to join them and fight other indigenous people. For example, at Fort Neruka, that's our Tuscarora stronghold. Other Indians assisted the Europeans in taking us down. When they took us down in North Carolina, working their way uh, through Ohio and out that way, that opened the door all the way up to the Lakota, Blackfoot, that whole territory became open after they took us down here. So let's go back to blood. Percentage is the colonial code language for divide them and conquer them. The doctrine of conquest. Take a few drops of other now let me let me let me rephrase that a few drops of other blood dissipates into the more dominant gene pool a few drops of other blood dissipates into the more dominant gene pool if you take a little medicine dropper and drop only one little drop of chocolate milk into an eight ounce cup of white milk ask yourself does that turn the white milk into a chocolate milk at that time based off of that one little drop does one drop of Irish blood make you Irish does one drop of Chinese blood make you Chinese how about Italian Russian Jewish so if this isn't true for them then how did one drop of black blood completely cause many people to not be able to claim their ancestry by being classified as black, colored, and Negro, how did the how did how did the one drop of black make it into the law books, and one drop of everything else doesn't matter? 
Have you asked yourself if they put emphasis on that? It must have been a threat. Have you thought about that? To separate the two nations was to their benefit. For the two nations to, to stay joined was to their detriment. So they created these separations. Can you see the game being played with your intellect? Can you see it? Can you, can, can you see the continued war waged on indigenous America? They're playing with your minds. They're playing with your intellect. You're either too light and called white. You're either too dark and called black. And even some that fit right in the middle are still ignored by the government when it comes to recognition. Still fighting 40, 30 years and on trying to be recognized by the government because they've been put in impoverished conditions. So they're looking to that as a way to get out of the impoverished conditions by being able to qualify for certain grants and, and things of that nature to improve their lives. Can you see the game? Many federal tribes don't recognize state tribes and many state tribes don't recognize other tribes who haven't even achieved state recognition. The powers that be are toying with your intellect and you're letting them. Don't let them. If anyone says something differently, then they're trying to manipulate your thinking and speaking to you as an ignorant person, assuming you are the idiot they helped to create. Like dogs and horses, our value is determined by percentage of blood. We've been reduced as a human or real people, and many of the indigenous people today have taken this percentage animal pedigree thing and claimed it and even use it to belittle other indigenous people. You've been played. Wake up. This is the epitome of colonization. And because of this divide and conquer bloodline tactic, many won't claim their own relatives disown them. We all have two grandmothers, right? We have that grandmother before European contact and we have our grandmother uh, after Euro-colonial occupation. Now follow where I'm going. The ones before occupation Look to nature for everything. And the ones after colonization look to European religious customs and traditions and religions as it was introduced to populations worldwide. Regardless of how our grandmothers became Christians, me personally, me as their grandson, have to honor both of my grandmothers, not one over the other. I honor the dark-skinned ones and the light-skinned ones, the ones who married Europeans and the ones who married Africans, the ones who were raped and the ones who were enslaved, the ones who fought and died, as well as the resilient ones who found a way to survive. When you pick and choose one over the other, then you are promoting European colonial ways and values and supporting a system designed to genocide us out of existence. Are you doing this? Don't answer. Just think about it. I'm trying to appeal to your common sense. I'm going to talk about religion specifically Christianity because that is the religion in question on this continent. Worldwide, all religions have a hand in murder, genocide, and depopulation, and so forth. 
inhumane. I mean, yes, we can find we can find the pretty side of it. But when you look deep enough, if you go back in history far enough, you will also see the gory side and how it started. Most religions started out bloody. But over time, people forget that part of history and you only see the lights and the trinkets. So, a little bit of Skurri history here. I am not a New York Tuscarora or a Robeson County Tuscarora. I'm a Wokan descendant. I'm a Wokan Indian. And I'm Skurure, called Tuscarora and contemporarily called Cape Fear Indian. I descend from both. I live on this side of the county, so I'm not from Robeson County. I didn't migrate. My family didn't migrate north, so I'm not from New York. To understand what that means, you would have to learn about the Tuscarora Confederacy of North Carolina, the migrations north, the states we settled in on the way, the tribes we mix with on the migration trails north, as well as the ones who never left North Carolina. And lastly, our migrations and mixing within our state. And we'd had people who migrated as far as Florida, and we'd had people who, um, we had Tuscarora communities in South Carolina, uh, in the Charleston, St. Helena area. So you have to understand the dynamics of the movement. We even have family who are federally recognized Tuscarora in New York. Tuscarora medicine man, Mad Bear Anderson knew this as he occasionally enjoyed trips to North Carolina to see his people who are still here. And these are his words. He loved coming down here to visit his people. Feuding between the tribes in, the North, in North Carolina still continue well after the colonial Indian Wars, which itself created serious fragmentation between all Indian communities as a whole. This is something that we have in common with most Eastern Woolen indigenous nations from the bottom all the way to the top of the East Coast. During that time, a lot of the Tuscarora fled and tried to escape the persecution that they were uh, forced to endure. So some assimilated into other races, like my family. Some stayed in the surrounding counties while others migrated along the North Carolina trails. Some claimed to be Cherokee. Because Cherokee, during that particular timeline, they weren't enemies of the state. At one point, they were, at that particular time, they weren't. It was safe to say that, Cherokee. To say you were Tuscarora was a death sentence almost. At one time, South Carolina said if, it, if any Tuscarora were caught in South Carolina, they would be killed on the spot. In North Carolina, the governor petitioned Virginia to come here and exterminate all the Tuscarora that was left. So yeah, it was dangerous to be Tuscarora. So you would claim to be black, mulatto, white, if you were light enough, white, um, just hid in the swamps, anything to survive. In the early 1800s, around 150 families and seven chiefs moved to New York. Today, they're referred to as the New York Chiefs. And back in the 1800s, after they moved, they started to sell what was left of the Tuscarora land here. So our people who refused to move, consisting of the 600 plus families, and uh, the five chiefs actually scattered and blended into the wooded terrain, joining with other tribes, assimilating into other races while keeping silent about our native heritage because it was very dangerous to be us during that timeline. It's still dangerous even today in 2022 because of the blatant opposition, hate, prejudice, racism, and continued genocide by many of the same ones many generations later. Historians have fashioned and tailored parts of our history to better suit certain groups of people, certain races even. The record rooms of the courthouses throughout the South mysteriously burned down to bury their lives, reclassifying us, the indigenous to this land, 
as a completely different race of people, writing some of our nations as extinct, denationalizing us, and claiming to be experts of our people, meaning they think they know us better than we know ourselves. They will paint a picture that our oral histories are inaccurate, mythological hearsay, and their colonial records are far superior to our oral historical traditional ways. So when you um, when you start reading books and um, written by historians and looking in colonial records, you'll never find oral history. You're always going to find the written accounts of the Europeans who were trying to interpret language and actions and ceremonies and things at that time. That's why there's a lot of errors in their writing. They said Oscarure left North Carolina and claimed to even have the support of the ones who left. That's another fallacy in the colonial records and evidence of their intentional, deceptive misinformation. Because according to their records, some of our nations are still extinct. Went extinct and don't exist anymore. Oscarure left and relocated to New York. They didn't mistakenly say these things. They intentionally lied intentional lies we're not extinct we woke on Cape Fear Indians Tuscarora people we are not extinct in North Carolina we are alive and we're well the power you had over us by our reclassification has been taken away from you and your leverage is gone we're wide awake today is a new day my people are from here we never left. My people were the ones written about on the East Coast, Yichibuare, Sea Breeze. And we are still here. Now that we have established our continued existence to the present day, let's dig a little deeper. Let's get a, a little hardcore truth here. I said I was going to get into religion and, and all these things. I will explain as I go on. Assimilation has been rephrased as recognized. You need, there's going to be people listening to this only for the purpose of finding faults, faults, to try to pick it apart because they have little, they have big egos and, and their self-esteem is is damaged, no self-esteem. They want to find something wrong with it. A fault finder always find faults. You got to remember that. You're going to find a fault if you're looking for it. Fault finders always find faults. They're going to try to find it here because I'm talking about recognition. Oh, he's attacking recognition. He's talking about the recognized tribes and so on. I need you, <laughs> no, you need, I don't need you to do this because I understand what I'm getting ready to say. It would be <clears throat> to your benefit to go to a law library and use the law books, the same ones used in law school by attorneys slash lawyers slash judges in court to understand legal lease. It would be to your benefit. I'm going to I'm going to explain something about recognition. Assimilation has been rephrased as recognized. Recognition in law means ward, domestic, dependent, and subordinate. All of this is the offspring of the doctrine of discovery. Ethnic cleansing was legal. See, we're, we're speaking about legality. That's why I said law school. All these things are the, are, are the offspring of the doctrine of discovery. Legalese, legality. So ethnic cleansing was legal. Slavery was legal. Invasion and occupation was legal. The doctrine of discovery is still legal. There's... 2,000 untested chemicals in packaged foods. And this is 
legal. Why? Because it's legally approved by the FDA. It's legal. So never use legality as a guide to morality. Facts aren't pretty. They don't care about your feelings or your belief in them. They are neither politically correct nor respectful to human life. It's not a respect of person. It's just law. It is what it is. The popple bull is evidence of the statement with the doctrine of discovery still existing on the books in our present time. You, you may ask, what is a popple bull? The Papal Bull, Intercatorera, issued by Pope Alexander V on May 4, 1493, played a central role in the Spanish conquest of Requesueno, the new world called Turtle Island. The document supported Spain's strategy to ensure its exclusive right to the lands discovered by Columbus. All European nations became party to this act of conquest by the way of the Pope's blessing to colonize the globe. But that's the 1400s, right? Something so long ago still can't be active today, right? Wrong. In 1823, a Supreme Court case, Johnson versus McIntosh, the doctrine of discovery became part of US federal law and was used to dispossess native indigenous aboriginal peoples of their lands. Other cases in this Marshall Trilogy are Cherokee Nation versus Georgia and Worcester versus Georgia, 1831 and 1832. Cherokee Nation versus Georgia in 1831 was a United States Supreme Court case. It ruled that it had no original jurisdiction in the matter as the Cherokees were a dependent nation with a relationship to the United States like that of a ward to its guardian, as said by Justice Marshall. I can't make this up. Justice Marshall said this, not me. Even though, even though this existed before us, it's still alive and active today. Is it time for us to get over this? The way so many of them keep suggesting we do? Like when they say ignorant things like, can't y'all just get over this? That stuff was in the past. We got to live today. Slavery is over. Just let it go. We're not doing those things our ancestors did. We're all one people. Can't we all just get along? Why are you so angry all the time? Why are you always marching and protesting? Can't we just forget about the past? Let me ask you a question. How long is long enough to get over this stuff? the unspeakable travesties from the many massacres against our indigenous people, from residential school trauma, slavery, Jim Crow, slave codes, female and male rape, theft of land, the flooding of drugs and alcohol into our communities, ghettos and reservations, experimentation of releasing diseases,